and welcome to another CBE MHN Newsmakers interview. My name is Paul Rasta. I'm the executive editor of Commercial Property Executive and Multi Housing News. And we're delighted to have as our guest today Mark Sandy, who's the chief economist at Moody's Analytics. Mark, of course, is one of the most influential and sought after economists around today. His counsel is widely sought by everyone from Congress to corporate boards, major trade associations, and reporters like us, and he is a frequent presence in the media. Mark, uh, welcome and thanks so much for joining Good to us be here. today. I can't, can't believe it's been a year. Uh, you haven't changed one bit. Well, yeah. <laughs> You're too kind. Yeah. Too kind. Well, I'd like to get started by talking a little bit about the big picture, Mark. From where you sit, what are the, the big picture trends on your mind right now in terms of the economy? What's changed? What are you looking at for 2019 at this point? Well, I mean, this year started off more. This time last year, things were kind of rip roaring, if you recall. We had the tax cut uh, legislation. Uh, Congress and the administration were about ready to sign a piece of uh, legislation to raise government spending. So we had a lot of fiscal stimulus in the economy, the deficit finance, tax cuts, increases in government spending. That really juiced up growth. So we were experiencing the strongest rates of growth during the entire 10-year-long economic expansion uh, a year ago, about 4% GDP growth. Right now, uh, things have slowed. In fact, it feels a bit wobbly at the start of 2019. Growth is probably closer to half of what we experienced a year ago, closer to two. Two is 2% uh, growth is actually a key threshold. That's the economy's potential rate of growth. That's the rate of growth consistent and stable on employment. So that, you know, if you go much below that, then unemployment starts rise, things start to pull around. So it doesn't feel quite as good as last year. But I think, you know, assuming a few things which we may talk about around the government shutdown and uh, Brexit and the uh, President's trade war, you know, depending on how things go there, the year should turn out okay. Uh, it won't be 2018. That was the high watermark for growth, given all that fiscal stimulus. Uh, this year will be meaningfully, you know, I think it will be close to potential, uh, meaningfully less good than last year, but still not good year. And um, certainly one of the big stories so far in 2019 is that partial government shutdown. As you, again, look a little bit longer term, what do you foresee as the potential impact of that um, for, the, for the rest of the year? Well, of course, it depends on how this plays out. Uh, you know, this is obviously uh, devastating for the 800,000 government workers who aren't getting paid and several hundred thousand contract workers who are livelihoods have been disrupted. For the broader economy, so far, if this thing ended today or tomorrow, no big deal. You know, uh, the economy would get right back on its feet and be okay. But it, it's a corrosive on the economy. With each passing day that the government shut down, the more damage it is doing. Uh, and at some point, the administration won't be able to triage things. They've been kind of keeping things together with, with uh, paste and, and tape. Uh, you know, uh, opening up the IRS to pay tax refund checks. Uh, allowing the Department of Ag to uh, issue food stamps, uh, allowing FEMA to underwrite flood insurance. You know, they're kind of keeping it together. But they can only do that for so long. And uh, the other thing is, at some point, these government workers are going to bolt. Right? And, you know, these are not high-paid government officials. These are folks that really, literally, most of them paycheck to paycheck. And they can't stick around. They need make a living, they gotta pay rent, so they're gonna go they're gonna take other jobs. And so that means TSA is gonna be a problem, uh, air traffic control will be a problem, uh, things will start breaking. And so if this shutdown extends out into February, March, you know, the spring, then a whole different ballgame uh, the damage to the economy is significant and my expectations for twenty nineteen being an okay year will be not an okay it'll be much worse than that. I'd like to uh, drill down a little bit into some of the specific commercial real estate asset categories. And again, when you think about the, the larger trends in the economy, do you see any potential impact for the, the major food groups of commercial real estate, whether it's uh, office, industrial, hospitality, multifamily, retail? Given the current conditions, anything that you would want to single out or any asset category that you would want to single out for either significant new opportunities or significant increased headwinds in 19 compared to 2018? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think uh, key uh, to the property markets is job growth. 
and job growth is going to slow. So we saw very strong job growth in 2018. Again, it was a very good year for growth, given the fiscal stimulus. Fiscal stimulus. Uh, average monthly job growth was 200,000. Uh, that's a lot of jobs. Uh, if you told me when we meet again a year from now that job growth is closer to 100K per month, I see that sounds about right to me, even in my relative optimism. Uh, assuming everything goes reasonably right with the shutdown and these other geopolitical threats. That's a big change. Uh, that means less absorption of space. Uh, so the office market seems kind of vulnerable in that environment. Um, I, I do think, uh, you know, the, the other uh, market I, I'm worried about would be kind of high-end multifamily. There's a lot of, in addition to the weakening absorption, there's also a lot of supply. The other property markets, you know, less absorption is a problem, but kind of mitigating or cushioning the blow is that the supply side of these markets feel reasonably good. We're not getting a, you know, a lot of overbuilding, except in the high-end apartment market. The one uh, uh, place in the apartment markets that might fare well would be affordable uh, rental uh, or single-family rental, because people got to live somewhere, regardless of what's going on in the economy, and they're just going to trade down. Right, and they may not you know, become a homeowner, they'll stay a renter, and if they're not in a high-end apartment, they'll be in an affordable apartment. So, I, you know, I would think the single-family rental market, uh, the you know, affordable rental market would become better. Well, let's turn, if we could, to the capital markets, and particularly, particularly the outlook for the real estate capital markets. What should the industry expect in 2019 in terms of availability of, of um, capital, and rates and so forth. Do you have any concerns, whether it's uh, Fed policy or anything else regarding the availability of capital for the real estate markets? Yeah, I think capital markets will, will be very volatile, so risk on, risk off. Generally more risk off, though, than risk on, uh, which means credit spreads will be wider, means capital less available, uh, which means that cap rates, which have been obviously pretty thin, will be under some pressure. And if there's one thing about the property markets I'd be most worried about in 2019, certainly going into 2020, would be around the cap rates and valuation prices. And, you know, they, we've been in a period of, as you know, uh, very thin the cap rate spreads and very high prices. Valuations have been high, and I think that's where you might see more of a correction. Uh, you know, if not in 2019, certainly in 2020, of course, there's likely slow. So I think the capital markets just aren't going to be, here's a good SAT word for you, as propitious in 2019 as they were in 2018. And 2018, was, there was a lot of volatility. This is something to buckle in for 2019 2020. All right. Uh, well, um, one of the things that we were speculating about the last time we saw you was the decision by Amazon for um, HQ2. Yeah, I'm bummed by that. I was hoping for Philly, my hometown. Did pretty well here in New well, York. Well, yeah. it, it yeah. seems like we, we did yeah. okay. We yeah. did okay. And uh, like uh, as many aspects of it, that uh, was one of the surprises, I think, the, the selection of LIC. And, uh, but I'd like to know your take on that s selection in terms of, um, of the impact. Um, what, what are your thoughts about some of the speculation that, um, th that the impact might not be entirely positive on some of those locations, whether it's um, Crystal City or, or Long Island City, or uh, there's a third location in Nashville, of course. Uh, any, any thoughts about the possible concerns or negative impact? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, it, you know, you got a new neighbor, uh, and when new neighbors come in, there's an adjustment. And, you know, and some people uh, will be uncomfortable with that adjustment. And, you know, there might be a little bit more folks on the subway or uh, in an Uber, trying to get an Uber. But I think that's pretty small in the grand scheme of things. I mean, because of the way Amazon, if you, if you look at their plans, uh, they're going to ramp up, I think, reasonably. It's going to be a slow process. It's not like they're coming in with 10,000 people, you know, this year. It's several hundred and then several hundred more. And this is a big economy. You know, uh, a big place, and I think New York in particular will absorb it uh, very gracefully. I mean, it, it does depend on Amazon. Amazon obviously has to be sensitive to the community, and I think they, they will be. And of course, the city, you know, needs to take steps to make sure that the adjustment goes well. There, I'm less optimistic, but I think they'll pull off. I 
in the case of DC, that might be, that might be more of a disruption, right? I mean, just because of the size of the economy and the geography being, you know, being developed. Uh, so uh, there we might see more impact on affordability, rents, uh, congestion, that kind of thing than in New York. But even there, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a big deal. In the long run, this is fantastic. I mean, how can you not want the best and the brightest from all over the planet to be in your neighborhood? That, that is just, that would be a huge error not to welcome them in. Yeah, um, I'd like to look at this from one other perspective as well. Of course, there were dozens and dozens of cities who competed for HQ2. Most of them didn't make it to the finish line. But um, did that process um, have any longer term implications for the, the also rants in terms of bringing them more to the attention of uh, corporate owners? Um, or any other any other upsides? Were there any downsides for them other than the fact that they didn't get on the uh, on the winners platform? Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? I think it was a, a positive process. I think, you know, I think it. I'll just use my own experience being in Philadelphia. That's where I live and grew up. And Philadelphia has historically uh, been very ambivalent about growth and couldn't. We can't get it together. We got all these chambers of commerce and different stakeholders and we never could get on one page about anything. Um, in this case we got pretty close to being on one page. Now, you know, was it wasn't uniform and you know there's voices that said they don't want to do this, but generally I think we got on the same page and we organized ourselves and we made a sh shot at it. And I think our experience is similar to the experiences of these other cities. So I think it was generally a very positive good thing. And even though we lost the uh, the bid, we felt. I, I think people generally felt pretty good about what we accomplished in the uh, collaboration that occurred. And it was, you know, it was chambers of commerce. It was the city. It was the universities. It was, you know, Moody's. You know, my organization got involved. So, you know, I think that was, uh, you know, very, very therapeutic. It also kind of helped uh, focus the mind on those places in the city that really would be good locations or something like this. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think they were they were secrets, but I think they, you know, we sh uh, well, the light was shown on them, and I think that might make them more likely to be developed more quickly than would be the case uh, in the process. So generally pretty good. I mean, the one uh, interesting thing, maybe downside, is it does, um, you know, in New York and D.C. had to ante up a lot of money. You know, the taxpayers had to ante up money to get these guys, Amazon, to actually commit. Uh, which was interesting because when we did our analysis, you know, we equally weighted all the factors that Amazon said they were looking at when trying to make a decision, one of which was the cost. But at the end of the day, cost didn't matter because uh, that cost was borne directly by taxpayers. So they weren't really worried about, you know, the actual cost of, you know, uh, the office rent and space and land and everything else. So, that was one of the reasons our ranking didn't work out. And, you know, it's the first crack at this in a long time, trying to help underserved communities and getting investment dollars into places, rural areas, you know, inner cities, and are capital starved. Uh, so, you know, I'm all for the effort. Uh, the, the actual uh, regs, you know, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think it's a game changer. You know, maybe you get more, a little more, um, you know, uh, new development in some areas, but I'm not sure that would be stuff you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Uh, so maybe on the margin, uh, but having said all that, uh, I don't know that this is written in concrete, right? So, you know, next piece of legislation, we can come along, learn what we, what, what didn't work, what could be changed to make this work better, and hopefully at some point our Congress and our President can come to terms on something and they can sign a piece of legislation to make this work more effectively. So I guess bottom line, I'm skeptical that it's going to be, it's not a game changer. I'm skeptical it's really going to change the dynamics in these, in these communities, but I'm hopeful that we use this as a learning process and we uh, you know, continue down the path and make this even better. And, and uh, you know, maybe some, at some point with those changes, this will, this will in fact be something that really changes these communities. Mark, before you go, I'd like to ask you one of our favorite questions to pose, which is, what's keeping you up at night right now? As you mentioned, there, the, the prospects for a certain amount of growth this year, modest growth, appear to be pretty good. But that said, 
is there anything that you're concerned about right now that, that's on your radar that you would consider kind of worrisome for the economy this year? Oh, you see the economy. Oh, I was thinking about my uh, daughter and her German boyfriend. That was well, well yeah, there you go. <laughs> Must you ever come back to the United States? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, well, you know, it's hard not to worry about what's going on in Washington, D.C. And, you know, right now we're focused on the shutdown. But we got a, a number of other things that are coming in quick succession that the president and his Congress have to have, actually have to do something. They can't just punt. And they can't just say, shut down. I mean, the next thing up is the Treasury debt limit. I don't even remember that. But the debt limit was, um, was uh, suspended uh, until March 1 of this year, which is when it's reinstated. And when that happens, the clock starts ticking. The Treasury has cash to pay bills, interest payments, Social Security checks, everything, until probably August or September. And then they run out of cash, and then somebody's not going to get paid. And if we don't have a piece of legislation, again, signed by this Congress and by this President, to raise the Treasury debt limit, then we got, we're in a world where this isn't a shutdown. This is a whole different ballgame. And uh, that will obliterate, uh, you know, uh, my outlook for 2019. And I'm just mentioning one thing. There's other things on the roadmap. So the thing that keeps me up at night is these guys can't figure out how to get in the same room and talk about anything. I mean, we're fighting over a border wall. I mean, you know, so uh, that's what keeps me up. Well, well, Mark, on that um, cautionary note, I'd like to say thanks once again for taking the time to join us today and share your insights. As always, you've given us a great deal to think about. Uh, my guest again has been Mark Zandi at Moody's Analytics. And uh, Mark, appreciate your time. I hope we get to uh, to visit again and catch up again very soon. Well, yeah, I have a track record, so uh, it's a dangerous thing. Th th there you go. We, we've got you on tape. Yeah. It's on camera in the archives. There you so go. We, we know what you said before. Right. So again, thank you again uh, so much, Mark. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today.